In today's video, let's talk about the elephant in the room when it comes to cardiovascular disease. There's a paper from 2009 that we really need to address, and this is the elephant in the room. This analysis involved data from 136,000 people that were hospitalized for coronary artery disease. They had an event, maybe chest pain, shortness of breath. Maybe they had a, a heart attack, a myocardial infarction. You might be wondering, well, what is their LDL cholesterol levels? Because you've heard from your doctor and you see it on the media and, and uh, pundits here on YouTube and in podcasts talk about the importance of lowering your ApoB containing lipoproteins like your LDL, your remnant lipoproteins, your VLDL, because they're atherogenic. They crash into your artery walls and they cause plaque. Okay, so this is a paper that was published in not a conspiracy journal. It's a high impact paper. Lipid levels in patients hospitalized with coronary artery disease. An analysis from 136,905 hospitalizations in the get with the guidelines. I think this is a cohort. So this is a large cohort of patients hospitalized with coronary artery disease. Almost half have admission LDL levels less than 100 milligrams per deciliter. Now, if you don't really know what it, what is a high LDL cholesterol or a low LDL cholesterol, most doctors would want your LDL cholesterol levels to be less than 100 milligrams per deciliter, okay? Oftentimes, whether it's Quest or LabCorp, you might see the levels become bold or show the little H for high above 130 milligrams per deciliter when it comes to LDL cholesterol. So again, more than half of the patients that experience an issue, they're hospitalized, they have chest pain, they have angina, they have shortness of breath, et cetera. They have low LDL cholesterol. Now, here's what's even more interesting. More than half of the patients have admission HDL cholesterol levels less than 40 milligrams per deciliter. In my opinion, a low HDL is more indicative of cardiovascular risk and poor metabolic health than is a high LDL, but that's neither here nor there. They go on to say these findings may provide further support for the recent guideline revision with even lower LDL goals for developing effective treatments to raise HDL. Okay. So I think this is really interesting stuff. So the take home from, you know, this paper is, well, gosh, we have to get LDL even lower because there's a hypothesis amongst the medical community. And that is known as the continual exposure hypothesis. So the longer that you have high LDL, that just increases the probability that the LDL particles as well as VLDL and remnant lipoproteins will crash into your vessel wall and initiate this process that we know to be called atherosclerosis or plaque formation. So lower must be better. But again, the thing that is really ignored in many of these papers is that the immune system is intimately involved in this formation of this foam cell and, and this uh, atherosclerotic plaque. And we need to talk about why is the immune system being activated? But first, I want to thank our show sponsor, the folks over at Maui Nui Venison, the makers of the highest quality red meat, on the planet. I love the meat, it tastes amazing. I love deer meat in general, but this Axis deer meat tastes phenomenal. And they have a great venison meat stick that my daughter and I love to travel with because she's an elite athlete. She actually raced at cross country nationals, raced at USATF track and field nationals. And so trying to find good, healthy grass fed meat while you're on the road, as you know, is really hard. So we just brought two boxes of the Maui Nui venison sticks with us. Uh, a blend has a uh, heart as well as kidney and liver in it with the venison meat. One has just the venison meat. So we have two different options. She loved it. I loved it. She did great. She placed ninth in nationals at cross country nationals among 400 girls. Uh, so this stuff really works, my friends. It's again, one of the highest quality meats out there, way more antioxidants, way more protein per calorie and way higher omega-3 fats compared to what you're going to find at the grocery store. So you can save by going to mauinuivenison.com for trash HIH. Again, that's mauinuivenison.com for trash HIH to save. Let's get back to why is the immune system being activated? Well, it's likely because LDL is becoming oxidized or modified in the vessel wall or near the vessel wall, and that is causing the monocytes, a uh, subset of an immune subset cell, uh, to then be converted to a macrophage and cause this foam cell, which causes the fatty streak, which is linked with plaque. And so I think it's really important that we expand this conversation to hey, what is triggering the that initial step of this foam cell formation or triggering the LDL to become modified or oxidized? And even more importantly, how is LDL getting into the vessel wall itself? Because there's several recent papers and Nick Norwitz actually sent this one to me uh, just last week. 
And prior to that, I was reading this one that I'll share with you right here, titled Endothelial Transcytosis of Lipoproteins in Atherosclerosis. I know this is a lot of jargonistic words. Let's slow down and break down what this means. Well, these lipoprotein particles are macromolecules. In healthy cells, they can't just cross a cell membrane. But in dysfunctional cells, for example, people that smoke, people that don't exercise, people that have high blood sugar and high blood pressure have leaky endothelial cells that might allow uh, modified or oxidized lipoproteins to come into their vessel wall and to initiate this process that we know to uh, be characterized as atherosclerosis. So I think that should be something we should be focusing on is the endothelial tissue, which I'll talk to you shortly about some of the symptoms. In men, a symptom would be erectile dysfunction. If you have ED, erectile dysfunction, that would suggest you have the other ED, which is endothelial dysfunction. So that's a good symptom. And we know there's plenty of epidemiological data to show that people that have erectile dysfunction have higher risk of cardiovascular disease. Now, you might be saying in women, how would I know if I have endothelial dysfunction? Well, if you're on the spectrum of insulin resistance, like you have prediabetes or you have high blood pressure or you're a former smoker or if you don't, if you don't exercise, those would be indicators of possible endothelial dysfunction. Now, there's a few ways to actually assess this using arterial pulse wave velocity. And so there's a few different companies out there. I've had this tested myself. It was back in 2015 when I started this channel with a Dr. Scott Van Der Wielen near Green Bay, Wisconsin. I'll share with you that video. Uh, to my knowledge, this has not been readily accessible for most patients in mainstream medical care, although I think it would be really worthwhile. This is a great way to look at the elasticity of your arterial and venous system. And so if you don't have elasticity in your endothelial system, then you might have increased rigidity from placking and beyond. But getting back to how is the, how are, I should say, plural, how are the lipoproteins getting across the vessel wall? Uh, it turns out that this scavenger receptor on the monocytes and macrophage plays a really important role. And so that's what I wanna introduce to you today is thinking about cardiovascular disease through the lens of an autoimmune-like condition. Now, there's different criteria. Uh, I talk about this in my book, The Belly Fat Effect, and it seems that obesity meets four of the five defining criteria of an autoimmune disease. So if we think about cardiovascular disease more generally or broadly and atherosclerosis more specifically in the context of being an autoimmune-like disease, I wanna share with you this paper, Mechanisms of Plaque Formation and Rupture, and this is a uh, quote of a paragraph titled Lipoprotein-Driven Inflammation. And I think this is underrecognized. And I think part of this is because it's really hard to pinpoint this obtuse inflammatory process that is going on in the body because most people's inflammatory cascades and biomarkers don't start to really increase until disease processes have been manifesting for years. We know that sometimes c reactive protein in some people doesn't really increase above two for a long time. In contrast, if you have a cold, maybe you get COVID or you get the flu, your CRP can be like 15 or 20. And that can scare people. I actually had a client whose CRP was in like 15 or 20. And I said, have you been sick recently? And they said, oh yeah, I'm just getting over the flu. They retested their levels and their CRP was back to 0.4. So getting back to LDL oxidation, I think this is important and I do recommend Boston Heart Labs because they do look at LDL oxidation and other inflammatory markers. So we know that lipoproteins can cause, uh, or that inflammation can alter the lipoproteins and render them more likely to contribute to this inflammatory cascade that we know to be ca uh, called plaque. So getting back to the paper here, LDLs cause atherosclerosis by accumulating in the arterial intima where they may be modified by oxidation and or aggregation. The modified LDLs and oxidized lipid moieties derived from them in turn act as chronic stimulators of the innate and adaptive immune response, i.e. atherosclerosis can be likened to an autoimmune disease. So we should be looking at it as such. Now it's curious because we know that statins, they inhibit an, a very upstream pathway in the sterile or cholesterol biosynthetic pathway. The enzyme known as HMG-CoA reductase is inhibited by the statin medications. But we also know statins have anti-inflammatory properties. It would be very interesting to look at a study to see if the purported health benefits and cardiovascular risk reduction linked or ascribed to taking a statin is associated with a reduction in inflammation or more so with lowering cholesterol. Maybe we'll have a study at some point to 
that will address that. But going on to the paper, these so-called modified or oxidized LDLs induce endothelial cell and smooth muscle cells to express adhesion molecules, vascular cell adhesion molecule one and intracellular, intracellular adhesion molecule two, et cetera, that attract monocytes and macrophages to the party and cause this placking formation. So I think a more interesting question, provided that as we introduce this conversation, that more than 50% of people that present at a hospital with an acute myocardial infarction or coronary artery disease have low LDL cholesterol. So should we be focusing more on the inflammatory aspect of this? What about new t testing or new diagnostics to rule out or differentiate? Because I will share with you labs, two different set of labs here. One is a 45-year-old elite athlete who after doing a fasted exercise session, her LDL cholesterol, as you can see, jumps well over 350 milligrams per deciliter. We know exercise is so good for your heart and your, and your cardiovascular system, so it's hard to make the argument that in this individual who has excellent cardiovascular health, really low blood pressure, uh, looks phenomenal compared to her peers uh, as she ages, uh, and then this is another endurance athlete who after exercising, running six miles every day, of course, you can see his LDL cholesterol has gone up in the post-exercise window. But we know exercise is so good for cardiometabolic health. So I think it's important that we start to look at this conversation that is atherosclerosis as an autoimmune-like phenomenon. And if you are eating a diet that will maybe raise your LDL cholesterol, but your inflammatory biomarkers are low, and your general inflammation is low, then should we be really concerned there? Because I will share with you on the screen other research articles finding we know that patients or people with uh, osteoarthritis and joint disease, and, and these are generally not just from mechanical wear and tear, they're from metabolic-induced inflammation. So many people that have insulin resistance and, and uh, prediabetes and obesity often have a joint disease and osteoarthritis, but as they lose weight, the arthritis in their wrists and their hands uh, gets better because they lower leptin. We know that leptin is a chronic inflammatory cytokine. So I, the whole premise here is that we should be looking just beyond lowering lipids and focusing on systemic inflammation, lowering uh, markers of obesity and beyond because it turns out that we can't disentangle LDL cholesterol from the immune system. So I think we should be considering the autoimmune-like phenomenon that is occurring and manifesting in the form of plaque. And that leads me to conclude that we know that cardiovascular disease and atherosclerosis is a concomitant phenomenon with people that have autoimmune diseases people with multiple sclerosis, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, asthma allergies, they also are at higher risk or have increased uh, progression of coronary artery disease uh, of placking. And so I think it's important that we sort of shift the narrative and talk a little bit more about ways to reduce chronic inflammation in the body. I would love to know what you think in the comments section, but before we go, let's review top comments from the last video. Simply K6965 says, I used to live in the Caribbean. I had to drive everywhere to get around. My workouts consisted of 20 minutes of cardio and some weights. I was in the best shape of my life, even after having two children. I'm now living in a country with minimal sunshine and I look like a potato. So we know exercise is really important. Exercise reduces chronic inflammatory biomarkers. Exerkines are anti-inflammatory. So when you exercise, your muscles make exerkines, which exert anti-inflammatory properties that of course, lower risk of cardiovascular disease, but also autoimmune disease and all-cause mortality. So yes, I think you should exercise and especially outdoors if you could. So thank you for that, Simply K, but please start exercising uh, even in this country that has minimal sunshine. I'm not sure where that is. Okay, the last comment here, and as always, friends, if you wanna leave a comment, there's a good chance you'll be featured in our next video. This is from Two Live is Christ for Eternity. We spent a year living in Ghana, and spent three plus days a week lounging at the pool and the beach. You were in the sun no matter what you were doing. I was eating fresh fruit daily, and despite all the sugar, I was losing weight easily. Now back in Canada, I continue to gain weight regardless of my diet and struggle to lose weight. Some of that is being middle-aged and going through perimenopause and having PCOS, but the difference is striking. I'm going to start taking high levels of vitamin D and K2 to see if that helps. Supplements can obviously make a big difference, especially if you're not getting enough K2 in your diet or you're not getting enough sunlight, but supplements can never totally supplant sun exposure. So definitely still get outside. Even on a cloudy day, you can get a, a lux meter, a photometer, 
you want to be getting at least a thousand lux during the middle part of the day. So go out, going out and taking a walk, even on a dark cloudy day is way better than sitting inside. Even if you're not getting the UVB induced photosynthesis of vitamin D in your skin from the sun, just getting outside even on a cloudy day is really beneficial, especially if you live up north like Canada. So let me know what you think in the comment section below, my friends. Please leave a comment and there's a good chance we'll read that on the next video and we'll catch you on a future one down the road.